The Pearl of the Soul of the World by Meredith Ann Pierce. Nine, bright burning. Ariel traveled alone over the endless dry dunes toward the witch's mirror. The pearl helped her see soft places in the sand, avoid those banks that had begun to shift. She walked a long time before pausing to rest, and even then it was not fatigue that stopped her. If I press on too hard, Aaron will do the same, she found herself thinking, illogically, and yet she halted, strangely sure it was for Aaron's sake. She envisioned the dark girl miles away, sinking down, one hand resting on the pommel of the sword, unwilling to unfasten it. Even now, when Aaron brought her little skin water bag to her lips, Ariel tasted water. The dark girl took a handful of flavorless chick seed from her pouch and chewed on it, coughed dryly, sipped again. She sighed heavily, and at last lay down, cheek pillowed on her arm. Shoulders slumping, Ariel felt the kind of resonant fatigue. Abruptly, she caught herself, surprised how vivid her imaginings had been. It was not her own weariness she sensed, but that of her far-off friend. Did some connection now link them, pearl to sword? Ariel frowned, wondering. The dark girl's presence seemed to overlie her own vision. Lightly, if as distinctly as an image reflected on water, if she ignored it, it faded. Yet when she paid it heed, it sharpened, growing more vivid. Exhausted, Aaron slept. Later she awoke. Ariel rose and walked on. The night lengthened. At last, Ariel neared the desert's edge. The sand underfoot turned from pale orange to gray or, to gray or drab. Bits of parched broken ground showed through. An occasional frayed shoot thrust up through a crack. She sensed Aaron leagues, distance, leagues distant, also nearing the desert's edge. The dark girl hove into sight of an allied camp sooner than Ariel had expected. The terrain of the waste was uneven there fraught with canyons and cliffs. Guards and sentries stood posted everywhere. They stared at Aaron as though she had returned from the dead. You know me, she snapped wearily. Stop gaping. They made no attempt to stop her, only called for their captains. Where is he? Irolath, Aaron demanded. I bring word of Ariel. They stared at the glaive, burning white in its sheath. The Ariel. She heard others muttering a buzz. A message from the Ariel. <coughs> Excuse me. Far away, the pale girl had to smile. Already, her name, like Ravenna's, was being used as a title. Impatient, Aaron stood, strode past the sentries without waiting for their leave. She headed toward the great council tent at the center of the camp. Rose silk billowed huge, breathing and sighing in the slight desert wind. Again, the sentries gaped, but these had the presence of mind to cross their pikes. Aaron halted. Ariel heard voices through the tent's open entryway. My son, we must press on. Brother, Ariel or no Ariel, our troops cannot simply continue to languish here. Night shade upon day month, cousin, going nowhere. Hand resting on the pommel of her sword, Aaron told the sentries, Let me pass, I come from Ariel. Within the drone of dis within the drone of discussion abruptly ceased. Who's there? demanded a voice. Though rough it was surely Irolath's. Ariel fought the leaping of her heart. Sentry answer your commander, a second voice directed, lighter pitched. But for all that, more like the princes that Ariel had ever realized, his cousin, Saber. Ariel's throat nodded and a bitterness welled in her mouth. She had not wanted to think of the bandit queen again so soon. Other spears, other voices murmured. At Irolath's word, the two guards uncrossed their spears and stood aside. Aaron entered. Through the dark girl's eyes, Ariel glimpsed the lady Silva and her Istran sons, her own brother, Roshka, and Talb the mage, even the lawn, Penderlon, they clustered about a folding camp table on which rested a map weighted with odd objects, a sheathed dagger, a flagon, a stone. Someone moved through the others from the table's far side. Walking the wasteland, absorbed in her vision, Ariel stumbled. Dismay glanced through her. She scarcely recognized a man. She felt Aaron's start of surprise echo her own. Oh, husband, Ariel murmured, Irolath. He was so thin, he looked weathered to the bone. 
The broad, high planes of his cheeks stuck sharply out, the cheek beneath hollow and shadowed. His sark hung loose from the shoulders, the sash at his, at his waist cinched tight. He looked like a whippet, like a desert racing cat, like a man in whom some guilty inner fire burned, consuming him. He won't live to which... Th he won't live to reach the witch's mirror, Ariel found herself whispering in terror, and the image came to her again, unbidden, of Irlath falling towards storm-tossed emptiness. Desperately, she thrust the fearful thought away. She stood halted in the middle of the flat gray expanse of wasteland now, staring at nothing, seeing only what was happening in S Silva's camp, leagues upon leagues away, watching through Aaron's eyes. You are much changed, Prince, the dark girl said. A gap of several paces separated them. And you, the one before her answered, late companion to my life. You who deserted us so abruptly in secret, so soon after she was taken, that many wondered what your part in her abduction might have been. His words were quiet, keen, and hard. I, too, had a trusted companion once, the prince continued. One who betrayed me to the witch. Miles distant. Ariel flinched at the barely veiled accusation. Before him, Aaron snorted, refusing to be baited. I left because my errand was urgent, she snapped. Now I have returned, having lately been with Ariel. The others in the tent stirred, murmuring. Silva, the lady of Isterness, took a step forward as though to speak, but her son, the Prince of Averick, spoke first. Have you? he scoffed. Then you have been to the witch's palace and back? His voice held such a brittle edge that Ariel shuddered. I have been to the city of Crystal Glass, the dark girl replied, her own voice angry but controlled. The prince's very presence grated on her. Ariel had never before Ariel had never before this moment realized the extent of their antipathy. That is where Ariel had gone. You lie, his vehemence surprised even Aaron. Either way, you lie. If you have been with the, if you have been into the city, you have not been with Ariel. If you have been with her and are now returned, you belong to the witch. Your last brothers shifted, shaking their heads. Hayden, the youngest, murmured, "Brother, hold." But Irlath ignored them. All eyes locked on Aaron's. I have been with Ariel. The dark girl told him quietly, firmly, at Crystal Glass. And is she well? The prince exclaimed, almost calm again suddenly. Then tell me what the witch had made of her. Is it a Lorelei like herself that devours men's souls, or perhaps a female dark angel, an Ikari? She needs another to replace me, you know. She's only got six now. Or a Herodin, perchance, such as we met at Orm, or even a Wraith. Is that it? Has she made my wife into a Wraith? Tell me. Ariel stood, fists doubled at her breasts, able to perceive it all so vividly across the miles, yet powerless to intervene rather than stand helpless. She almost wished she could break the link between the dark girl and herself, tear the pearl from her own brow or the sword from Aaron's hand, but she dared not lose sight of Irlath even for a moment. She was well when last we spoke earlier this fortnight, Aaron replied, outwardly implacable now. Yet Ariel felt... How hot the dark girl's anger burned just beneath the skin. Then why is she not returned with you? Irilath's cry was not so wild this time, but full of anguish and a fury to match and overmatch the dark girl's ire. Ariel stood dismayed. She is on her own. She is on her way to face the witch, Aaron replied evenly. Alone, the Prince of Averick shook his head. A weak, unsteady laugh escaped his lips. One hand was was in his hair now, clenched, become a fist. He whispered, <laughs> Lies. Irilath, Irilath, calm yourself, Ariel exclaimed. No one heard, but her words were echoed by the Lady Silva. Penderlon rumbled. Roshka spoke low and urgently, and Hayden beside him. Talb the mage shifted uneasily, fingering his beard. Unheeding, Irilath touched the hilt of the edge adamantine. Much as Aaron's hand rested upon the broadsword, bright burning, Ariel felt the dark girl's jaw hardening. I am not a liar, Prince Irilath. 
Her hand tightened on the sword with a start. The young man leaned forward suddenly, staring at Aaron's weapon. Ariel heard the sharp intake of breath. His eyes had become like blue lampfires burning. That glaive you bla that glaive you bear is witch made, he breathed. I doubt it not. Her handiwork is unmistakable. Ariel gave me this, Aaron grated. Disbelieve if you dare, you faithless wretch. She spat the last word. It is only your own falsehood gnawing at you. That of the knowledge that this whole war hangs on her, and you are nothing beside her, no match to her, and never will be. Horse is a madman, the young man cried. You are some cat's paw of the witch. Without warning, he sprang, covering the paces between himself and Aaron in less than a moment. The dark girl's eyes widened. Through her, Ariel saw the sweat on Irolath's brow, the scars threading one cheek, and animosity in his hot blue eyes. My son, no, the Lady Silva gasped. Adamantine flashed in the prince's hand. Its snaking blade gleamed with, right, with white radiance, its edge so keen it could cut anything. Already Penderlon was springing. Behind him, Roshka and the prince's brother shouted, bolting forward to stay him. The guards in the entryway were near, but they would all be too late. The sword was beginning to fall. It would be over between one heartbeat and the next. Perceived through the dark girl's eyes, Irlath's blade almost appeared to Ariel to be flashing down upon herself. Seething the dark islander wood, refusing to retreat. Aaron! Ariel screamed, throwing up one arm as though somehow to fend off the adamantine blade. At the same instant, Aaron unsheathed the sword. She brought her own long, straight, burning blade up in a clean arc to meet the white serpentine edge of the prince's short sword. The two blades met with a sound at once like a silver bell and a low flute note with a bandolin string sharply plucked. Ariel fell to her knees, feeling the shock resonate through her through the whole length of the edge adamantine was blocked and held. The blade that could cut anything could not cut the burning sword. And there we will pause. <laughs>